Hello, my name is Nicolas, and I'm delighted to welcome everyone at our webinar entitled The Ecologies of Coexistence and Conflict. I would like to welcome everyone that is with us on Zoom or on Facebook, everyone that's in Cyprus or abroad. I would like to welcome people of all genders, ethnicities, abilities, and disabilities, people of all sexualities, of all ages, and of all faiths. Finally, I would like to welcome people who identify as activists or ac academics and also people who don't. This event is a collaboration between Histories of Bachchess and Avli. I myself represent Avli, which is an online platform that focuses on the intersections between peace and environment. Avli is also a gathering point and a resource for anyone interested in transforming Cyprus into a peaceful and sustainable island through the methods of environmental peace building. Histories of Bachchess is an indie webinar series which highlights fresh and exciting work related to social, cultural, and political histories of Cyprus. Each month, Bachchess editors discuss with academics, scholars, and artists about their research and writing. Some logistical information about this webinar. This webinar is currently being re recorded and live streamed on Facebook. And then this webinar is going to be uploaded on YouTube uh, of Histories of Bachchess. So in case you don't want your face to be in, uh, make sure not to show your face. Um, if you have any technical issues, feel free to message me or Lambros. Also feel free to follow us on any social media to keep up with our events, campaigns, and activities. And finally, I would like to invite everyone to come up with questions without, throughout the session as there will be a Q&A session at the end. Um, and now I'm happy to pass on the mic to Loisas to start with our webinar. Hi, good evening, friends. I am Loisas Capsalis, uh, one of the founding editors for the uh, Bachchess Histories of Cyprus. Tonight, uh, my guest is Dr. Irene Dietzel anthropologist, educator, and author of The Ecology of Coexistence and Conflict in Cyprus, exploring the religion, nature, and culture of a Mediterranean island. The Ecology of Coexistence brings together an exploration of the religious cosmology, the social relations, and environmental culture of the Cypriots, while investigating how these are related to the history of coexistence and conflict on the island. Dietzel argues that our relationship with the natural world, for centuries rooted in profound ecological knowledge and the sense of stewardship of the land, forests, and water, was eroded by processes linked to colonial domination, interethnic conflict, and the post-colonial need for rapid economic development. This colonial legacy continues to influence environmental politics in Cyprus, which have intensified in the last decades, defined by the acceleration of the destruction of natural habitats around the island. Irene, it's really nice to have you with us. Good evening. Good evening to all of you. Thanks for having me. It's exciting. I wanted to start by asking, what is your connection to the natural world before writing this book? Did you have some special connection to um, the natural world? <laughs> yeah. Um... Maybe I'm developing one now, um, but I think we all have connections to the natural world by being uh, human beings. You know, if you go into the forest, you just feel great and you realize that's where we needed to be all along. I live in Berlin, so it's a busy city um, and I need nature. But I think my, my, my relationship to nature has changed by studying it and I came to it um, by following something entirely different. I was just wanted to understand society and I ended up um, studying ecology with it um, because it answered my question. So maybe the relationship to nature developed um, mm. uh, over the work. I always loved the Mediterranean um, because I'm partly from there. Mm. So, but who doesn't love the Mediterranean? Yes, I, the next question I wanted to ask you is, how did you uh, come to study Cyprus and the, um, the ecology of the Cypriots? Um, a long way, it took me a long way. I, um, I, 
I'm actually a scholar of religion. So what I do, I started um, ever since um, studying religious studies in undergraduate and later in graduate studies. Um, I look at all kinds of religion, everything that can be put into this box, uh, religion, um, various social complex phenomena. And um, so what I've found over the years is um, if you want to understand religion, don't look at religion. You look at what surrounds it because uh, that's where it comes from. So really the study of religion is interdisciplinary, always has been. It's not that old, it's about 150 years old, if you like. And um, so it combines sociology, it combines anthropology, history, languages. And in the last couple of years, um, it draws also from um, environmental studies. And that's what um, the theory, that's where the theory comes from that um, carries my book. In your book, you bring together um, a nexus of philosophy, uh, religious studies, uh, history, and ecology. Yeah. What does, what is the link between these, um, these disciplines for you? Between history, ecology, anthropology, the world. I mean, so what I, what I do in this book, yeah, I look at the ecology of coexistence mm. and conflict and mm. um, it, it is trying, it is like stepping back and trying to get a bigger picture. Um, ecological thought forces us, us to, um, to consider more, consider um, everything that could feed into the system. It forces us to think in a, in a way cosmologically about um, uh, human aspects of, of soci sociology and what you maybe call more than human, I call non-human mm. um, um, aspects, as long as they are maybe have material. So ecologically, thinking eco ecologically is thinking about everything that could have material impact. Uh, on something so yeah. that's that's I think that's how they are related so thinking ecologically is also drawing together many disciplines mm -hmm. and one of the things you you mentioned in sort of the opening part of the the book is that you want to shift from geography to ecology and I think that's a really important distinction to to make at this uh, at this point yeah yeah, you, you think about Cyprus, I mean, everybody who's been going to school, school in Cyprus and uh, and learned about the history or learned about national history, you learn about borders, we learn about countries, you learn about um, um, extensions, territories, and we also learn about nations in a geographical sense, like in a two-dimensional, you know, they extend to there. But Geography is something that you can draw on the map, but to quote something very, very big, someone very big in religious studies, uh, Smith has said, map is not territory, you know, it's like what you can draw geographically does not include uh, these many, many dimensions that I've tried to um, explain um, on the ecological level. Mm. So it's a step also into um, increased complexity. Um, mm -hmm. thinking also about an um, ecological um, dimension. Tell me more about this complexity. Uh, when, when you embarked on this, on this project, what was it that you were kind of hoping to, to bring to the conversation um, that is happening in, in Cyprus? Or so what happened? Yeah, I always wonder <clears throat> when I try to think back to the moment that made me look at um, ecology, I have to think back to the time when I was studying Cyprus in my graduate studies uh, following the minority. So you see, I was approaching the, the Cypriot conflict, um, learning it from someone who did not grow up on the island uh, from an um, outsider's perspective. Um, seeing that it's a highly charged, uh, very ideological um, kind of two position st story. And I was studying ethnic minorities in Cyprus. And that gave me somehow a backstage pass to Cyprus, to the Cyprus conflict, if you, if you will. We were studying it from the margins. And um, I was 
writing my MA on the Armenians in Cyprus. And then I said, OK, I can follow up and learn more about the Maronites. And um, I was invited to go to Kormakitis, which is uh, a Maronite village in the northern part of Cyprus, whoever doesn't know, uh, an enclave. And um, one of my interlocutors there, he was very, very friendly. Um, they showed me how they built the village, how the village was in the past, a little ethnographic field work, very haphazard. And he showed me the field around the village. And he said, down there by the, by the tree, that's the so-and-so neighbor's lot, you know? Over there at the stone, that's my um, aunt's daughter. And over there, that's mine. Over there, it's like there were no fences, no demarcation, no line whatsoever for the outsider to understand who owns this place and how do they cooperate. And I was wondering, what's the sense of place here? How come a Cypriot who's grown up from that generation in, in the countryside can develop such an, um, an understanding of their mm -hmm. language? So I got interested in landscape and also in the forces that shape the Cypriot landscape. And that mm -hmm. brought me to um, an ecological um, perspective on Cypriot history. And I thought that was lacking in the anthropology of Cyprus. Mm -hmm. Great work in the anthropology of Cyprus, but so far there was very little on um, the environmental practice. Mm -hmm. In your book, you trace this uh, environmental kind of culture of the Cypriots through time. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the early chapters, you talk about a, a kind of traditional or pre-modern environmental culture that is based on particular ways of uh, sort of cultivating the land, sharing water um, rights, uh, managing, uh, the forests. And this culture develops in sort of the Ottoman uh, period in, in Cyprus, roughly from the, the 16th to the 19th century. Uh, can you sort of tell me a little bit about this kind of traditional environmental culture that you're describing there? Yeah, this is not a very, very big question. Um, I'll, try to, <laughs> I'll try to pin it down to the pillars of, uh, of this concept. I mean, we're looking at pre-modern uh, environmental practice, pre-modern agriculture in a mm -hmm. province of the Ottoman Empire, something that's not uh, not highly developed. So governance, Ottoman governance is um, haphazard, sketchy over there. You know, this it's not it's not the main focus of um, Ottoman government governance. So many things happen in the shades, um, out of focus, and also grow organically. We're looking at um, a big rural class and a very small um, ruling class, the Ottoman class. And we're looking at what is called the Riaya, so lots of peasants who live on the island. And they develop certain subsistence practices. What is subsistence farming and subsistence um, agriculture? It is um, a high labor, so lots, lots of people get involved. Um, production of the means for survival from day to day. And uh, what we find here is an um, incredibly rich portfolio of different practices that are combined. And um, they are A, typical for the Mediterranean, um, I will get to that later, and B, they're facilitated by the legal um, framework that the Ottoman mm. govern, uh, governance um, provided. And um, just to give you an example, what they were doing is from Mediterranean ecology, they were they were having a combination of practices that brought them into the forest, onto the field, into the harbors, from top of the mountains and down to the valleys. They were they were keeping flocks of animals while they were also tending their gardens, orchards, and fields. And they were working around their villages and also far beyond in the next three villages down. And they were trading among each other. So it was a very complex involving yeah, forests, fields, gardens, and animals. One of the examples that you give in your book is the shifting cultivation mm -hmm. of land. Um, tell me a little bit more about that. Shifting cultivation, yeah. They, um, the, the, the British didn't like that. 
it's um, well, the British calls it fitful contradiction, very um, unorganized, um, terrible. They didn't uh, not understand it. Incidentally, the Dutch saw the same in the tropics and they call it Rufbau, so um, robbering and um, some kind of robbing the environment. They did not understand it either, either, but we see that it's a global phenomenon. It's not, it's rather typical for the tropics, but you find it in the Mediterranean and it involves um, clearing patches of vegetation, sometimes the forest, burning it down and, and then planting it and uh, running a cycle of plantation on this place and then leaving it fallow and moving somewhere else and making um, a new field. So it involves fire. Fire is um, also, as we say, ecosystemic and belonging to the Mediterranean ecosystem for a long time. So they find that in Cyprus and what we gather now, um, we can understand from an anthropological standpoint that it enabled people, um, they, they were obviously had very, uh, a wide range of mobility. Yeah, they had their, their, their fields over there and their fields down in the valley. And they enabled them to respond to the pressures of the environment of the Mediterranean, to which I would like to talk a little more later if, um, if there's time. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, the British didn't like that uh, shift in cultivation and as part of their um, intervention to, um, to curb this practice um, later on and as part of the colonial logic, which we'll get to, I imagine. Yeah. I, what I wanted to highlight here yes. is this idea of um, the, the, the kind of deep ecological knowledge that is required to undertake the kind of um, shifting cultivation, the, the clearing and the burning of land and uh, managing the timing of this, of this process that you, you sort of highlight in your, in, in your book as well. Yeah. Um, it's, it's astounding. I don't think that we find people who have such um, ecological knowledge nowadays in our environment, not on Cyprus. Maybe on Cyprus, a couple of mem members of the older generation will remember. And of course, people who have gardens, they have more ecological knowledge. I mean, this grows through practice. So we have a very high... Uh, mm, we have a good uh, distribution of knowledge in this time. We're speaking about the Ottoman era. Yeah? So we have um, a distribution of what um, anthropologists call traditional ecological knowledge, or TEK. It's a big word in indigenous studies. So when you look at indigen indigeneity, so-called na natural natives, um, what, 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 is, what is the knowledge they have about the environment? It's astounding. So in Cyprus, we have not only the knowledge of soil, and where they are good, but also knowledge of rainfall. We have, you know, this fragmented topography in, uh, in Cyprus, like in the wider Mediterranean, where rain falls on the one side of the uh, of the mountain, and the rest of the the other side of the mountain is a flat desert. You know, it's not fair, but that's how it sometimes is. So they know about precipitation. They know about um, soil. More than that, because they have such a varied portfolio, they know about um, herding animals over fields that with the dropping from the animals the fertilizers so they know how to combine silvo agropastoral system and um, when their wheat field doesn't work out because you know they have maybe carrots somewhere else so that they can buffer for this change and this is also a tremendous knowledge this knowledge was um, mostly uh, um, handed on orally, yeah? there was uh, from generation to generation, shared among neighbors, and uh, here and there monasteries also wrote down the bot botanical knowledge, you know, they the cataloged botanical knowledge. Yeah, tell me, tied to the population of knowledge. Yes. Tell me a little bit more about the role of um, these monasteries and as well as the, the FGAV. Um, the religious foundations of the Ottoman um, era. I imagine that for the majority of our people listening to us, Efkaf is uh, a concept. 
I hope so. I mean, it is a, a religious foundation in the Ottoman Empire, and Efkaf is protected by the Ottoman law, by the property law. It does not have to pay any taxes, but it has to be for the greater good. It is a religious institution, and not only the, um, they were not only Islamic Efkaf, but they're also the Orthodox Church and monasteries were treated as Efkaf. Uh, Vakufia, we say in Greek. And um, it was, first of all, because it was protected by Ottoman law, um, it played an immense role also in governance. Um, but we have specialists of Efkaf in the group, so I don't, I'm not going to talk. Uh, I think someone of you is like doing a PhD on uh, Efkaf system, it's exciting. The monasteries are very big on Cyprus, I don't have to tell you that. Um, there are only one part in the overall landscape of agriculture, but they are a very important one. They uh, provide mills um, and centers for the subsistence practice. I can, I can collect the olives, I can collect other carbs, but some, um, other fruits of my garden, but sometimes I need uh, further um, infrastructure to work with them. So we go to the monasteries to the Efkaf. The Efkaf, the Islamic Efkaf also are very known for the systems of irrigation. So they provide infrastructure within this very complex uh, agricultural landscape. But they're only a fraction of what the religious landscape looks like in fact. They later have a political role to play, of course, in the 19th and 20th century. And we only see that before that there were actually big agricultural players and they were also making a little surplus and money in the trade. But could you also tell me about the, the kind of uh, their role in sort of stewardship of the, um, let's say the, the, the forests or the waters of the island? Mm. Stewardship is a word that is fairly new, um, although, those who propounded would like it would like to think it's ancient. So it is a word to describe um, it is a theological term. Um, it's the word to describe in Islamic and also in um, Christian theology the, the duty or the role of humankind to play within creation. There the Islamic and the Christian theology are very much alike. As you know, they both uh, rest on the idea that there is a God, a creator, uh, made everything, and humankind has a special role, and we are there, the gardeners. Stewardship theology is fairly new because it actually came up in the 19, in the 20th century, in the 1960s, when we all started to talk about thresholds and limits to growth, and we were starting to become aware of the ecological crisis in the West and globally. And they were then the theologians coming to the fore and say like, well, we are, we, are, we are actually stewards. That does not mean that the idea of, of human beings protecting their environment is new. And it could be a very old idea, but it would not be in general, the idea human beings have to protect nature. You know, the, the idea of nature as we talk about it today did not exist in Cyprus during the Ottoman era. This is very important to understand. So the, what, what did people protect in Cyprus in the 19th century? It's hard to say because this is a, a peasant culture that did not write. So we have to glean and put together. And what we know through the, um, also the work of um, Laurafi, the, the folklorists, you know, who are, are very keen and studying uh, the rural Cypriots for other reasons, but they um, observe that there is the tradition of uh, tree worship, for example, in Cyprus. Holy trees that are protected from both communities, by the way, and, and sites that are considered um, special natural sites, sometimes holy parts of forest. Also places where water springs for understandable reasons they're considered holy and then subject um, to protection. But it would, I would not call it yet a, a theologically conscious steward, stewardship. You know, this, is, this is theology talk. You know? But they love certain trees that are deemed 
Holi and the places where the Panayaya reside, you know, and uh, that are well protected also. I think this is a really important point, and I think in order to to kind of highlight um, this a little bit um, mm -hmm. better, perhaps can you say this? So this um, environmental culture that we're talking about is it shared between the communities? Uh, is it a common uh, environmental culture? Yeah, th this is this is um, this is what's so special about Cyprus. Maybe the Mediterranean. Um, we see in the overall Mediterranean that Muslims and Christians in the pre-modern time share a whole lot. And they share um, visibly, and what we know, they share shrines, they share uh, sacred sites. Um, they may have their mosques on one hand, they may have their churches on the other side, they may have their own cafe neon and the other cafe neon, but they share holy sites. And when you look at these sites in the peasant environment, you see that these sites have an ecological value because they mm. are either they are uh, there are places like a holy tree we just talked about a spring or there are places of trade and the trade is part of uh, this portfolio this mixed uh, practice is the subsistence practice trading microeconomic trading uh, is part of the um, strategies of peasants so both groups if you like also the minorities but muslims and christians alike in the peasantry shared these um the these ecological practices and they they were not so we're not talking about niche niche specific ethno um ethnic uh, cohabitation so where in other parts of the world uh, the one ethnicity is herding and the other ethnicity is keeping for uh, keeping garden now in cyprus we have many ethnicities doing the same thing and sharing um, then the environmental culture and you can see it in the food we eat you know the environmental culture produces um, necessarily um, our culinary culture and that's why in the mediterranean we have the same staples we don't eat other things not like they only eat meat and we only eat bread no we have shared staples and you know the music and so many other things we share can be can be uh, explained through a shared peasant culture. Mm. A term you use is sociogenic. Uh, could you kind of uh, explain what that means and how it relates to these cultures um, that are shared? Yeah, sociogenesis or sociogenic is a very academic term. It actually just means it produces society. And uh, the person who came up with this term uh, was uh, it's a study that I discussed uh, because I have to compare Cyprus to other parts of the world because we're looking at socio-ecological relations. It is an uh, actually comparison with Bali of all places. So you can compare Cyprus and Bali not because they're islands, you know, um, but maybe also because they're two islands, although the, the climate is very different. So I, I look at uh, Stephen Lansing's study on uh, the rice fields in Bali and um, the involvement also of the priest class in the cultivation of rice. So they basically have a mountain, the, the, spring, the springs are on top, the water trickles down and on the different levels, people, villages have their subak, their rice paddies. So on this entire landscape on the side of the mountain is an engineered landscape. It provides the right kind of irrigation for all the rice paddies and the right cycle of cultivation and harvesting and cropping to minimize pests. So they were, they were managing pests long before pesticides. Um, they were managing irrigation. And how did they do that? They yeah, they did that and they produced an entire society with kinship patterns, with uh, village organizations, with hierarchies and solidarity. So working the land makes a society. That's all that really says and it mm. shows. This Bali is actually part of the um, UNESCO heritage, you know, because mm. it was studied by an anthropologist, actually. Uh, I wish the same could have happened to Cyprus, but it's too long, too long away. 
So, yeah, so that's social genesis. But it sounds to me like there's this system in which um, you have a, a sort of common uh, uh, kind of um, environmental culture and, and uh, common practices relating to um, the, the, the forests, the waters, the, the land. And this kind of produces social relations that are then necessary for the maintenance of this system. Absolutely. And these social, social relations um, that come about is what anthropologists and scientists call neighborhood. I mean, this is, it's a term, you know, it's, we speak about neighborhoods, yeah, neighborhoods we see each other, but neighborhoods is not only walking down the street in, in, in Horyo, it's not only going to Casemion. The neighborhood extends outside of the village and between the villages, and as we have seen also, into fields that are kilometers away. So these are networks, people have to cooperate. So yes, through intensive cooperation and subsistence farming, um, a society comes about that would share it in fact. Mm -hmm. What happens when the British arrive? <laughs> what happens when the British arrive? Many things, of course, and many things happened before as well. Um, all I want to say, I mean, there's, we talk about post-colonialism, decolonization with good rights, and I think we're going to be for a long time. And it's very exciting to have just finally start talking to Cypriot about colonial, post-colonial times uh, after Eoka, you know, after nationalism, thinking like, oh, well, hang on, we're part of the Commonwealth. So, you know, there's, there's a whole discussion going on. I just want to say that studying the British coming to Cyprus, they came with good intentions. They really did. And especially many, many of them came, you know, but sometimes you want to, you want to do good, but you don't. You end up implementing a policy, meaning well, uh, that destroys more than it produces or that it helps. And uh, many things happened uh, with the British. I can't, uh, of course, uh, refer to all of them, but what they mm. did is that they, um, they discontinued something that the Ottomans uh, um, gave the island uh, that I have to go back and explain mm -hmm. because that's really the legal con. Uh, we were talking about EFCA. We said that mm -hmm. the EFCA was protected. Mm -hmm. It was protected as one form of land. And the Ottomans allowed for many different kinds of land. And the category of land defines the use of the land. Mm -hmm. So not only the EFGAF, we had actually everything under the Ottomans was state land. So the Sultan actually owned everything. And you could um, buy a title or basically rent a rent piece of land, have a title. And this title to land as a, as a Cypriot peasant I could then inherit to my daughter or to my son to give as uh, a brika to my daughter. So it's practically ownership. Then there was full ownership, real ownership that didn't belong to the Sultan, that were the gardens, the houses, the, street, the gardens and the houses built on the land. There were also um, rights to water. I could own rights to water. I would not own the spring. No, no, the spring remained the Sultan, land, but I could own. Tuesday afternoon from four o'clock till the next day. That could be my property. There was also land that was belonged only to the village. Not only the village could use it only for herding animals, pasture and all that. There was Afghan land, we talked about it. And then um, there uh, was uh, common land. Uh, this part of the village, there was also holy sites where common. You couldn't sell them, you know, everybody. So in, in short, the Ottomans had a very complex land law that allowed for something crazy, multiple ownership. So mm -hmm. in Cyprus, we, had, we could have and have had many times one person to have the title to the land, the second person owning the trees on the land, and the third person owning the rights for the water. These three people and their families had to cooperate. And often these three people in this property group were Christians and Muslims. So this was the base, the legal base, I argue in the book, this and other things, that forced them to cooperate. 
No, they were had to talk because it was for a subsistence. The British came and they did not like many things that they did. They didn't like the shift in cultivation. They thought that was fitful and hazard. We want to get rid of that. And they did not like the complex Ottoman land law. It took them a while to get rid of it. It took them all the way up to the 1940s, 1946. That's the date when they abolished this land law and said there's only two types of land now. There's state land, there's private land, and nobody, only one proprietor per piece of land. And they didn't want any fragmentation. So you have big families, everybody gets a little bit, you know, and then you cut the land into little, little pieces and everybody has land here, land over there, and they didn't want, they wanted to consolidate. They meant well, we learn now that consolidation is not such a good idea because it decreases the possibility for an ecological strategy. You know, if the land doesn't work here because it doesn't rain, I go over there and I plant over there. So many things happen together, you know, it, it got into the time of urbanization. Mm, I think that the British meant well, they wanted to help, they wanted to intensify agriculture, they started well drilling, drawing way too much water. It was a time of the Green Revolution where people introduced uh, pesticides and uh, fertilizers. Uh, the British did um, turn um, the beaches into all the spit fight against malaria, so uh, we could have orchards by the beach. Mm -hmm. But changing the land law really fueled something um, that is now known the, as the property issue of the Southern country. Um, I'm going to stop here because I'm going to talk a long time about <laughs> this. But, um, I want everybody to understand what exactly happened. Mm -hmm. One, I mean, um, one thing that becomes clear from your book, and it's something that um, other authors, let's say Sarah Harris, for example, her study mm -hmm. on, on forestry in, in Cyprus, um, is that there is a profound misunderstanding here of the, the, the kind of depth of knowledge uh, that went into the maintenance of the the previous system uh, yeah. of cultivating the land, sharing the water resources, managing the, the forests. Yeah, I, I must say now that you mentioned Sarah Harris, uh, this work, my work, would not have been possible. Uh, um, not it would not have turned out like this uh, without the the work of Sarah Harris and also. Um, and um, um, great, great previous um, Ottoman researchers. So I don't know what, what happened with Sarah Harris, but her work really showed that the British, um, they did not like, they did not like the separate ways. They were, and they had a strong vision. You know, they were, in, they were in, uh, enamored with nature. Like nature, like we talk about nature, you know, the forest. They wanted to see green forests. They loved, they were reading Thoreau and Walden at that time. Uh, they were romanticizing about the forest. Mm -hmm. They came to the Mediterranean and thought like, mm, back in the Roman times, isn't it that there was lush forests in Cyprus? And there are beautiful forests now in Cyprus. And the island has them. Yeah, it's true. Um, but they envisioned that these, uh, these forests should actually be pure wilderness. You know, where, where humans do not dwell and humans do not meddle. And this is obviously not the case because the sea that is part of the um, strategy. They wanted to clear the forest. And as Sarah Harris says very uh, distinctly, there were three evils. You know, there was a shifting cultivation, there was uh, the fires and the grazing of those pesky goats. They didn't like the goats. And they made these goat restrictive areas. You know? And uh, they also claimed that people keeping goats and people keeping fields would, would quarrel with, with each other because the goats would eat the uh, fields and they would make peace by keeping the goat herds and the, the gardens separate. They did not understand that there was a combination. Yeah? And part of the quarreling is actually part of the crisis. I fight with my neighbor about the gardens, but I don't, I don't kill him. So um, the British came with this vision of clearing the forest. And um, yeah, that was couched in a, in a, in a greater idea of, of, 
of maintaining um, protected zones where nobody was meddling with. You know, humans mm -hmm. were not humans were not welcome in these zones. It's a little bit like our modern day of conservation. You know, this mm -hmm. should be not. This should be pristine nature. Mm -hmm. And they were met with quite some resistance, of course, as a result of their um, colonial enforcement. Incidentally, the, uh, the, the Ministry of Agriculture and Natural Resources of modern day Cyprus is an offshoot, of course, of the Department of Forestry. So I wonder sometimes whether they have um, thought about this um, misconception, maybe the colonial misconception. Looking at the the chat, um, yeah. but let's uh, let's um, let's keep the questions for for later, just because I uh, I think the the person asking the question should be able to to ask it the, themselves. Um, I just wanted to to sort of um, ask uh, about um, uh, the the 1946 land land reforms that you yeah. uh, mentioned. Uh, earlier and why you think they were such a such an important shift in sort of the ecology of Cyprus? Mm. They are an important shift in the ecology of Cyprus, but now they're also an important shift, an ecological shift, if you like, in the sociology of Cyprus, in society mm. of Cyprus. Um, as we have uh, learned from the history that landscape and people are intertwined and um, we know from the property issue, um, I remember that when I was living in Cyprus, listening to um, refugees speaking about, uh, in the South, speaking about um, their gardens and their houses and how painful it is um, to see how they have changed. And sometimes they don't want to go and they still haven't gone. Some of them have gone. It's a very emotional experience. And I was thinking, mm, this is as emotional as the churches, the derelict churches in the north, you know, another big issue, stone, stone of contention, if you like. You know? um, the property issue is not only about who owns what and who gets rep re reparation. It's a highly emotional affair. Mm -hmm. And looking at the history of property use, being the property being the hub of socio-ecological um, 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 relations in the neighborhood, I, I finally understand that property was something sacred and it was very, very complex. So the modern form of property is really geared to the modern market. Sell, mm -hmm. buy, sell, resell, exchange for value. And this happens at the time um, when um, relocations happen. Some people, Turkish Cypriots, have to leave their home. It's starting, it's then there's the Eorka campaigns, and then we have the uprising in the 60s, we have the civil war, basically. And all this is in a time of urbanization. People are fleeing the countryside, either because they fear for their lives, or they have nothing to give to their kids. They find work in, uh, in the city. So we have a very, very rapid urbanization, and we have all this land that is now left back. And we start speculating, because the new British law allows for selling, reselling, and we have the tourism industry that is blossoming. Actually, I'm from Rhodes, you know, Rhodes tourism grows in the 60s, like boom, you know, Famagusta was fully built then. So this is the, the biggest um, sector then, or it's not the biggest sector, agriculture is still the biggest sector, but it is a growing sector. And uh, land is being sold uh, very quickly, speculated with, and, um, there's some injustices that happen. Um, it's been 10 years ago that I did the research, but I remember land grabbing and now still very unclear um, states of propriety, who owns what. Uh, and um, this is only possible because this property is now, um, has been stripped of a symbolic meaning. It's mm -hmm. now formed, uh, it's a commodification, it's a commodity. Land has become a commodity, whereas before it was um, a means of meeting. Of, it was always, always part of negotiation, but it was uh, um, a carrier for identity. So and when we talk about... Entwined, entangled, yeah. 
go ahead. Yes. When we when we talk about this legacy of kind of the colonial uh, period, yes. um, is this what we are, uh, are referring to? Is this what you would um, sort of describe? Hmm. When we talk about colonialism now, we are in 2022. And <laughs> colonialism, the, the big phase of decolonizing uh, in the world happens in the 60s. This is, this is uh, more than half, uh, this nearly a century ago. So we're looking at the first modernity. And um, decolonization of, uh, or colonization was, there was the idea of modernizing. Uh, it, they were coming in the, to the island and Cypriots and British alike they said that we have to change the ways of these stubborn, obstinate peasants who uh, never listen to us and we actually want their good. We want their children to be healthy. We want them to be schooled. We want to have the better life. They were all, they were meaning well. That's very important to keep this in mind. Mm, you mm. know, it's not like that they came, it's like, well, no, no, it's just change everything and they, they see what they do and everything they do is wrong. They romanticize them too. Mm -hmm. So um, it, in the, we always wiser in the aftermath and looking back, mm -hmm. of course. Um, we are still, I think decolonization or dealing with the, uh, um, the colonial mind is a slow process and we're well mm -hmm. in it and um, um, and there's going to be phases to go through. I don't know, how do you see it? I would be interested to talk to Cypriots who have, who live in a country that used to be British colony, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll touch upon all of that in the, yeah, in the questions. I mean, uh, in my mind, um, I mean, I, I'm now thinking of the work of, let's say, Vaso uh, yeah. and sort of this ad uh, adoption of um, the Western way of thinking about ourselves, about mm -hmm. uh, our society, perhaps about the natural environment, um, yeah. the natural world, the habitats of, of the island. So there's no need for the, the outsiders to, to be here. We, you know, we, we do a good job of uh, maintaining their uh, ideas uh, yeah. ourselves. It's true. And why is that so? Because uh, due to the colonial past, you have ties to the world that you would not have had without, I would say, maybe. Um, so they're British schooled, British schooled anthropologists. This is what mm. they call the repatriation of anthropology. You know, first, like back in the 60s, there was Joseph Campbell writing about the Med Mediterranean. It was outsiders writing about the Mediterranean. And then there's a new generation of anthropologists who may have studied outside, they may have studied anthropology outside, but they come back with their languages, with uh, their roots, and they, with their new perspective. And uh, this, is, this is what makes anthropology so exciting. It's not only mm. some Westerners going to the so-called jungle and writing down, this is all very exciting, but exciting is that the people from the jungle, sorry if I just use this analogy now, people from the jungle, uh, write about themselves you know sometimes we're not there yet but uh, this is a very very um, rough way of speaking but in cyprus has has long happened of course um i wouldn't say it's subaltern because there's oh you, you know there's uh, many many facets to post-colonial studies mm -hmm. but this book by vaso sargiro is crucial because here you um see the logic of environmentalism that's what it, what he calls that and says it's um it's uh, the, the colonization of the unconscious. Unconscious, mm -hmm. that's what he said, the subconscious mind um, is colonized. And that's what I think is uh, the idea that in Cyprus there should be nature reserves. You know? There should be parts of Cyprus that are untouched, pristine nature, because it has always been like that. That's not the case. If we do that, if we keep uh, conservation, if it conserves, uh, parts of Cyprus um, as a reserve, then we do something that is entirely new to the entire region. It has not yeah. happened so far in the hundreds and thousands of years before, because the Mediterranean as it is, and this is what I've learned doing the research for the book, is an anthropogenic landscape. It has its shape through human activity over thousands of years. Mm. So, um, and understanding that 
um, is maybe a way of of of, um, of digesting this colonial uh, mind mm -hmm. that we all have. In the last part of um, the book, you highlight this, it's, it's like a paradox uh, in which a part of the, um, the local communities in yeah. places like Agamas see a lot of the, the work for the protection or conservation of the environment as a sort of imposition of a, a foreign uh, idea or ideology. Uh, and so resist. And this is seemingly what leads to an impasse in uh, what is happening in Cyprus right now. Mm. This is work that has been done in the 90s, the research. I remember also Gisela Wells did some research on that. Um, it may be different now. Um, talking to Avi, maybe we'll get some new experiences. It may reproduce what is still the case. Um, there's, when I talk to people in Koromakitis about uh, nature ecology and um, nature preservation, they said something like, e que no fame. So only the, only the, the, the careta careta will be safe and our kids will go hungry. So it's an anthropocentrism that you'll find somewhere else. Um, and um, every kind of environmental um, activism, I would say, that does not address this question of, um, oh, the fact that social, uh, society and ecology are inextricably inextric linked. Yeah, you can't think sustainability without the, the social aspect. You know, we know that. If you cannot address this, then we will not be very uh, successful in Cyprus, where the um, the skepticism and also the um, antagonism towards outside voices, Western mm. voices, um, is very strong for good reasons. You now, for good mm. reasons, this island has uh, been, you know, the focus of of, uh, of many interests outside outside its interests, and not always with good results. So. I think that's important that you we address it. We'll talk about this a little later, mm -hmm. how we could do this. We have not talked much about the church and the church was only, the church has <laughs> the FK history. The church is everywhere on Cyprus and the church already is, as we know, is a, a property holder and was a very central figure in the agricultural mm -hmm. system. And um, that's maybe the reason also why the bishop was so prominent in this um, mm -hmm. a kind of a dispute um, on the side. Um, but it's a whole different uh, chapter, of course, the church. I give the, I give it some, some attention, really. I did write another um, article on the history of the Cypriot church. So mm -hmm. <laughs> there is the drama, there is substance there, you know, that you have to look at. So. I mean, I'll take that cue and um leave the conversation here for now. Um, maybe we can discuss a lot of the issues that have come up yeah. um, with the audience. So let me um, say thank you, Irene, for um, speaking with me um, and pass the uh, ball to Nicolas, who is going to uh, now start the Q&A phase. Thanks. It was a pleasure to talk about it. Hello again. Um, thank you for the interesting and very informative, I must say, um, discussion about the ecologies of um, the past ecologies of Cyprus and understanding. Um, so now we're going to go to the Q and A. People mm -hmm. online can participate through in the in the chat, and then I can read the question. Also, people on Facebook, we can do that as well. Um, I want to start actually with a question. Um, I recognize that like, like natural reserves and untouched areas are something that came up from colonialism. But I think when we're talking about the Gamas today, like the opposing view of the people that want to intervene in Agamas is not coming from a place of this, this area belongs to me, I want to be part of it. It's my ecology. 
it, it's coming from a neoliberal economic growth capitalist viewpoint. So how do we talk about like how, how do we talk about against like colon decolonizing our understanding, but also making sure that this doesn't give room for more exploitation of natural reserves, like because Agamas has a like highest biodiversity um, of the island. Yeah. 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 Thank you for clarifying that. Um, um, I, I, I think it's very important to point out that Akamas needs to be a conservation area. I mean, for my, for my, um, not only for my estimation, because life um, has changed in the island, the pressures have changed, and the types of resource use have changed. And um, we have, we're, we're looking at it after the, the big explosion of tourism, of course, and now the interest for Akamas uh, maybe I want to use it to feed my family, but this is also after the fact that we have a highly speculative land market that grew in the 50s and 60s. We have this uh, very exploitative uh, sector and agriculture has changed. So the pressures on the island have changed. And uh, I wouldn't say it's because there's more people on the island. It's because the ways of subsistence have changed. And I'm not saying we have to go back to pre-modern ways of living. That would be out of out of touch with reality, we cannot. But we can maybe learn from the past that uh, the right to land, traditionally, and also three generations back, which is not that far, uh, was was something that people were um, thought was birthright. You know, I have a right to my property. It's my property, and only people who have property there are entitled to talk to me about the use. And um, so that is also pre-modern use. And this is a modern use of a karma. And that's something that can be very dangerous because um, it is also, it has, if, if I say it in a very um, romantic way, it has no meaning anymore. You know, it has no symbolic social meaning. You know, I'm not developing something with neighbors together that was back in the past, but I'm developing something for profit. And so I would wholeheartedly under, um, support um, protection of Akama um, as a new wilderness zone, something that hasn't happened before. Maybe Kali land, Ottoman land, that, you know, cannot really be used. Um, but the question is, how do we get there? How can how can one convince the of the, the, the good idea? In mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I'll give floor, the floor to Lilia. Um, she'll also, I, Lilia, do you want to open your mic or shall I read the question from the chat? Yeah, thank you. I'm not going to turn my camera on because I'm at work. Um, can you all hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you uh, both for this discussion. I'm just going to read my question. Um, the shift of land as carrier of identity to land as property is very interesting to me. Uh, but Cyprus is not a subsistence society anymore. Um, do you think that there are other ways in which land can be sociogenic in the absence of dependence on land for subsistence? And do you think there is a role for religion or spirituality in this? Thank you. Wow, they're very good questions, both of them. Um, I was thinking uh, about both now, but I'm trying to uh, and before this talk, um, the first one, um, the question is whether land can be sociogenic. I think land use is sociogenic. I think that's something that um, we have no choice of uh, deciding, uh, I don't want uh, living in a city sprawl to be sociogenic, but I want living in a nice village to be sociogenic. No, like we, the way we interact with the environment has an impact on society. It's not like that the environment has an impact on society, like people in the South get more sun, so they're happier and they're just nicer to each other. That would be just crude geo-determinism. De de but the way we interact with the na nature around us shapes society, not only when we're peasants, but also in an urban environment. But I think it would be good to be more aware of that. How, it, how does it do that now? I mean, how does being stuck in traffic for two and a half hours every day affect our society? 
and uh, being stuck in cars, how do I, you know, I don't see anybody anymore. It's just me and this little um, product I bought. So yes, sociogenesis is something that of eco, socio-ecologically, uh, we have to think socio-ecologically about all kinds of problems. That's my state. How can we involve religion in the concrete case of environmentalism in Cyprus is a very big question. And I'm going to lean out of the window, as you say in German, or go, go out on the limb or whatever. And I would say, like, you have to involve. You have to involve the church. And it will be a difficult task. You have to at least involve orthodoxy or something orthodox. Christian Orthodox, if you want to convince Cypriots of protecting their environment in a way that they have not done before, without just for the sake of nature. And how do you do that? You tap the resources that are already there. You use Orthodox theology, Orthodox eco-theology that is there in the Orthodox realm. I mean, not only in Cyprus, we have the Bartholomew, we have the Ecumenical Patriarch, of course, Cyprus and Autocephalus church, but if you start talking that um, orthodox theology protects the environment, there's the idea of stewardship, maybe more people will listen to you, and maybe you get some needed money from the church to do that. I don't know if it has been tried. It should not be ruled out. Just a food for thought there. Um, now we'll move to a question from earlier from Steph Gass. Um, I don't know if they want to open their mic to clarify. They said burning of land, good or bad. Um, burning of land, yeah. Well, um, a little bit of burning land, knowing how to quench the fire. You can see that people do that still, you know. You have patch and you want to plant and you just burn it, control fire. And you plant. I guess good or bad, it's always been done. And this is what how the landscape has been shaped in in the Mediterranean. So I guess within limits, um, it was good. But the big fires that we saw last summer and that we will unfortunately see again are not um, uh, they're not caused by agriculture as much as they're caused by maybe people wanting to develop the the land, build their houses, um, grow a match and we don't know. It, I don't think it's going to, it was controlled farming, shifting agriculture that caused this climate. So those are bad. Yes. I'll tell you that. Thank you. Now we're gonna, Andy raised their hand, if Andy wants to go. Hi, uh, thanks. Um, well, first of all, I just wanna say thank you so much. This has been, it's incredible to hear all this because it's so close to my interest and you said something um, that actually I, I had goosebumps when I, I'm going to read it again. Uh, you said neighborhood extends into fields in networks of intense cooperation. For me that was a beautiful uh, kind of uh, analysis and uh, a vision of how it might have been and how it might again be at some time or it even exists uh, and we don't even notice it for some people that still have this relationship, uh, um, let's uh, say between the inside of their house and what goes on outside and further out uh, uh, for, for those who are still maybe in connection with the land. <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, yeah, uh, I, I was wondering, because uh, I was also reading more from a planning perspective and a property uh, perspective, this uh, category is from the Ottoman law that's called uh, Arazime Truke, and mm -hmm. our uh, governments changed it into um, uh, which is mm -hmm. community ownership, community property. Yes. Do you, and uh, you never really hear anyone talking about this category, although it exists in the law still. Uh, can you yeah maybe talk a little bit more about that? That's very interesting. So um, it has some kind of aftermath. You know, it, it was changed. Yeah, it was maybe there was a memory of it. Commonage is called, and uh, I know it under commonage, and it's um, it's something that also medievalists in Europe uh, talk about. Um, 
we see it uh, more and more coming to the fore because people think about resource use more. And we see that it must have been quite common also outside of the Ottoman Empire um, to understand that um, gov uh, the subsistence agriculture necessi necessitates a certain level of self-government. Uh, self-governing as people have to decide how they move and they could do that in the ottoman empire because there was no agricultural slavery there was no feudalism people were free to move and in latin west they were not they were served they were owned by the people who held the land so uh but when the people were free to move and in medieval europe they were also some at some point um they they were organizing the local resources and how they're used and then commonage um developed that naturally it's like okay oh, cool. we all need places for our cows for our for our goats and herd we have to use them in common and we have to agree that uh it, it's not turned into a tragedy of the commons this is a big uh, um philosophy a text about this in the 60s where everybody uses it and then they use it up and it's no but commonage is actually managed so that it is sustainable what the Ottomans did in Cyprus is they were very clever. They had a huge expanding empire or they inherited empires. And um, they said, OK, what, what's up antiquo will be left up antiquo. So that means don't touch it if it works. You know, if it works, we'll leave it like that and we we'll put it right into law. So they saw that people were dealing uh, or using commonage and they wrote it into law. And that's how Metro came about. And it's very interesting that the holy sites like um, water springs or little little chapels, they're also part of it. It's kind of lost to us because we're in this uh, fast market now. You know? So we forget that this stuff was probably white and widespread throughout Europe. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we'll go to Maria. Um, Thank you both so much. There is so much to discuss. Um, I have two questions that are related to our relationship with um, nature. Um, the first one has to do with what has already been discussed, the decolonization. And I would like to um, ask about decolonizing knowledge and how we can do that in relation to our relationship with nature. Um, we have this dichotomy. Mm -hmm. um, that came with the uh, enlightenment between um, the the mind and the feelings and, and memory and also have this dichotomy um, which was drawn with um, um, uh, modernity and again the rationality so oral tradition does not have a place anymore it's not power knowledge if it's not a discipline according to Foucault it's, it's not power knowledge and the same goes with memory, like you mentioned, someone saying this is the grave of my grandfather, of, of, of my uncle. And we tend to devalue these non-power knowledges, mm -hmm. how we can decolonize these ways of thinking. And the second question I have in relation to our relationship with nature has to do with gender. Mm -hmm. Um, there is the seven generation principle, which comes from a tribe in North America which mm -hmm. now it's, it's, it became very fashionable uh, lately. And in my humble opinion, sometimes it's just green washing, parenthesis. Yeah. So this seven, I see some people nodding. So this seven um, generation principle is ab about planning um, seven generations in the future ahead. Now, yeah. women are very central in this because women are those giving birth. Mm -hmm. uh, and also this tribe is, um, has a very matriarchal system in which women are the stewardess, the, the guardians of the lands. And I've heard women saying, for example, in relation to what has already been mentioned, the refugees here in Cyprus and their relationship to their lands, I gave birth to that place. I started my family in that place, which I've never heard from a man. I don't it might be a coincidence, but I wanted to ask you from your research, have you seen the gender playing like playing differently in relation to the to the nature? Yeah, thank you. Um, also very two 
big questions. So um, I have a lot to say to the second one and also to the first. So I'll say start with the first. How to decolonize the mind is uh, it's a collective task. Um, and it goes only through the schools, Maria. So education is definitely uh, is going to be a pillar. And I think it's going to have to involve a lot of practical field work. So um, building gardens, um, seeing what is there. Um, if you want to save or save your knowledge that is there without, uh, that has never been written down, um, then you have to get the old people and see uh, what they remember. Um, um, this is um, one of the strategies and um, yeah, and, and visiting places. I think what's happening, uh, the intercommunal work that is happening in Cyprus is a long tradition already. It started, uh, started actually after division and as soon as the, the communities could come into contact. And um, they're also very women centered, um, but the intercommunal work is a good start, starting point. And um, I, I, living, in, living in Cyprus around 2004, just shortly after the referendum, I could see that with a grassroots moving, forming, that I hope has, despite all the obstacles, um, developed even further. So there's a lot of green line activism. Um, I think these, this, these are the paths to go to, also very laborious, and um, remembering history differently and, and seeing Mm, local history and trying to step away from uh, the big powers deciding about the fate of Cyprus. No, it's like what happened in Cyprus here that we did write down. And what is typical about Cypriot culture? And with the gender aspect, it's very interesting because it brings me to another shared culture between the communities um, that is distinct for Cyprus. We know um, that. Gender comes from marriage customs, for example. It also affects the way people live together. You mentioned those, um, the Native American or the seven generation principle um, in that culture you mentioned. Actually also Cyprus is in, although it's a patriarchal system, it has some matriarchal um, elements. It is matrilocal. So in, in Cyprus and also in the wider Eastern Mediterranean and the Christian, mainly Christian context, um, the Nifi stays in Cyprus, stays with, the, with her parents. So often you have this, um, that the, the daughter who marries gets the brika, gets the house, and that's where the, the newlyweds take place. So you have generations staying together. But it's not like that you have a daughter that you give away. You know, you have that when the kids stay there. So you have mothers and daughters often living together. And it's interesting that although Islamic law uh, prescribes in, in the wider Islamic context, the daughter is married away. There's bride price, bride price to be paid. And the daughter goes to the husband. In Cyprus, in the mixed villages, the states, they, 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 they copied the, um, the practice. So they, they had a similar residence pattern. A, res a similar kinship pattern, although they did not intermarry very much. Yeah, but they had the same kind of, and as you say, the residence pattern, the kinship determines the way we relate to the land that we inherit. So inheritance patterns and residence patterns are linked. So this a food for thought, you know, there is also um, um, a gender line to be drawn that I didn't do in this book, but other people did, and it's very fascinating research. Thing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now I'll give the floor to Nicolas. Uh, thank you so much, Irini. This is super, super fascinating. Um, so I'm very interested in the intersection of uh, ecology and identity. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you mentioned the 1946 land reform, um, what I was interested in is uh, the way that the British sort of parceled out the land on Cyprus, they also parceled their identities and made it more easily digestible to them. And I would push back a little bit on the idea that they had good intentions. I would say that just had, they had British intentions, which were to make Cyprus and their other colonies more easily make sense to their worldview. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking now particularly how the Cypriot identity has always been complex, but now has been changing over the last six years or so. I mean, not just Greek, Turk, Armenian, but also, for example, my mother is Polish, um, but you know, there are many other communities in, in Cyprus that are in are here and, and take part in the 
in the landscape and the ecology, but are left out of the conversations about identity. So kind of my question is, can we use and how can we use ecology to reclaim not just our relationship with nature, but the complexity of our identities and how can we use that as maybe a starting point? Hmm. Wow, thank you. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, thanks for bringing this back into the 22nd, uh, 21st century. You know, this is modern day Zagreb. We were talking about history for a long time. And I, just to uh, not to defend myself, not at all, but um, to explain why I ended up in ecology, because I wanted to explain this, this side of conflict. Actually, I wanted to explain how, how it was possible for uh, inter-ethnic for inter-ethnic peace. So how it was possible that the communities of Muslim Christians in the Ottoman era lived peacefully next to each other without many fights, and then came nationalism and so. That was the goal, and I cho chose an ecological path to do that to explain something social, historical. Now this is a book about the ecology. Now I haven't really posed the questions that you pose. How can we uh, protect? engage, um, affect the sociogenesis in Cyprus? How can we live better socioecologically? And these are very, very important questions. And these questions can only be answered by including new Cypriots who have been there um, like you, but also the, the immigration to the island since, since the 80s. When was the big immigration? Someone will help me when it started. Uh, um, um, there's also... Um, the uh, Sri Lankan community, there's so many different communities. I'm, I'm amazed how many different communities can live on one little island. And the only thing I can think of, and this is also, there's some very valuable and good research done on um, modern day uh, immigration patterns and engagement in civil society in Cyprus that I'm not a specialist in. But uh, I just think of the fact that the island was always subject to uh, flows, human flows. So anybody is saying this island belong always belonged to us because we were here first. That's you know they all they already came. I mean, it's the Mediterranean. People flow through the islands. They come and go. So Cyprus will probably always be subject to coming and going. This is part of the island ecology. So I'm thinking now whether you know there are thresholds on the island that are there and that should not be passed and there are many valuable questions in there, Nicholas, and I think um, we have to cooperate to answer them. So this is my, the end of my expertise, really. Thanks, though, for the question. Thank you so much. Now we'll go to Martha. Martha, shall I read your question or shall I, uh, you want to open your mic? Uh, I'm not sure if you want to read it because I'm not sure my university. Okay. Do you think religion is also a leeway to address illegal hunting practices? I'm currently looking into the legislations and processes that Cyprus has to tackle conversation, cons conservation issues about, but so far I am struggling to see this fruit of any of these legislations. Any advice as how to go about bringing social change to address exploitation of nature without having to go down the route of coercion? Mm -hmm. Well, there are many legal ways for you to go, but then you'd have to have a, have to ask um, someone who knows about environmental law. And um, I'm sure there's proficient people to talk to about this. In general, um, I, I haven't planned it out, but um, I think that um, in, in the spirit of think global, act local, if you go to the place you can see who owns what, there and what is the local history and how is the local church and who's got the local church. I have talked to people in the Cypriot church um, who were very cooperative and I could imagine that they would be interested in raising awareness um, in the spirit of maybe orthodox uh, stewardship. And um, this, is, this is one way I would choose, but you know, this is my answer to uh, engaging religion. I don't think that you could convince Cypriots so much about the value of tree worship nowadays. There are some who would think it's exciting, but overall the, the influence of the church is so prominent in many fields that um, it will be through the church to, um, that you could get any kind of 
religious support. And the churches, I'm sorry, I'm talking also about the Orthodox Church, but also there's the Latin Church and the Armenian Church and the Maronite Church. And if they maybe are concerned with anything else in their communal, um, they might be so bucked down with their communal um, concerns. Yeah, but it'd be interesting if someone picks it up. That's all I can say. I hope it answered the question. Um, we have 10 minutes left, just putting out there. Now, mm -hmm. I think it's the turn of me to talk. Thank you, Nicola. And thank you, Anna, for, for the discussion. It's very interesting. Um, very quickly, um, I, I want to ask about um, a discussion we have recently, and that's how Lee we've been, um, and other many other activists, environmental activists, have been very uh, against the efforts of uh, the Greek Cypriot administration to extract and exploit natural gas. Yeah. Um, and this thing has been in the past been used as a, um, as a, an argument that will bring peace uh, between the communities, the common, let's say, exploitation of resources. Uh, however, it has been seen that this is not the case as it currently things goes. And I wanted to ask if, it, if this has to do a little bit looking back on what you said in the past, that the view of the people um, of resources was that of commons instead of commodities, and that by seeing them now as, co as a commodity, this is, the, this is why um, peace and coexistence cannot come from common management of this exploitation. I'm not sure if this is the case. I'm, I'm asking of your opinion. Mm. Thanks, that's a very complex question. Although natural gas is also, it uh, surpasses me because this is, this is a sea-based gas, right? They're looking for drilling in the, in the sea. And then it's an international question on who owns these kinds. So it does not affect the ecosystem of the island directly. I always thought that people would develop, my argument was that people had developed some form of um, sense of the island, uh, of, its, uh, of its threshold and resources, they understood the island how it worked. They saw so how the rain came and where the water was, and they were mobile on the island. So they had an understanding on the island, and they also had an understanding of under pressure, you leave the island, you go to the mainland, or you go to some other island. So they had an understanding of this. And this was decisive also, or formative, formative for their sense of commonage, sense of using the land. They had not, I don't think, an understanding of gas being subterranean under the sea being tapped. Um, and of course, this is a pre-modern time. Um, and now we have, we have different obstacles and it, it, it is very important to, to, you know, we cannot choose pre-modern ways to solve modern problems. But what we can is understand, try to learn from history um, that, um, you know, local, maybe local governments is a good thing that's what we could learn is when it comes to uh, the environment. And um, because, yeah, um, my cat is also talking now, so I hope it doesn't bother. <laughs> it's like, meow, meow, I think you can survive. So um, what I meant to say is like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm worried looking at this. I'm worried because these are big, big uh, market players, uh, big money players that are now um, in, invested in this. And um, yeah, that's, um, that's all, that's, ah yeah, that's something that to look into a sector that you could mobilize for in general environmental activism. It has to go maybe through the church, but it has to go through tourism. You know, this is what happens, sustainable tourism. So if you have to engage the players, um, the market players in tourism, but now I'm leaving my waters, you know. I always thought tourism is that's what you have to regulate now because that's the big sector that defines how the environment is. Good luck for the work, all I'm saying. Um, now we're going to Maria and then everyone's head. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for organizing uh, this very interesting discussion. Um, 
I just quickly want to raise two points. I realize we don't have much time, um, but going on to something um, Irini said at the at some point, asking uh, whether the ministry or the state is currently um, thinking or addressing the issue of um, colonization of uh, of a, a, a reaction like Cypriot traditions and so on. Uh, like in my, my experience as like being part of various environmental um, initiatives, like the only time the Ministry of Agriculture or the state tries to address this issue uh, is when it wants to further exploit the natural space. Um, like an example is um, in uh, around Gikos Monastery, there's this illegal um, goat farm that has been built by um, the, the monastery there. Um, and it's, uh, it's really uh, detrimental for, for the, the forest uh, around the illegal uh, farm, as well as some of the um, bird species that uh, are currently, um, they, they made the vultures that have their home there. Um, and uh, when environmental activists are trying to counter and um, are asking from the forest department to close down the illegal, um, the illegal goat farm, uh, the response we're getting is that, well, goat grazing has always been good for forests and uh, it helps with prevention of fires and so on. Uh, and I mean, you, you can see the impact from like satellite images now, the, the farm has been there for four years. Um, so this is like uh, one of the attempts made by the state to um, kind of uh, talk about um, like uh, Cypriotness, uh, but in, in the very wrong way. Um, and just a point on the role of religion uh, on like on uh, trying to convince people about um, uh, protecting the environment. I think in in Cyprus, with in in the uh, southern part at least, uh, I think with the current um, heads of uh, the head of church and the different bishops. Uh, I think the last thing we can convince people who uh, who are orthodox is uh, to turn into like the protection of nature because the, they are doing exactly the opposite. So it's it's a very difficult thing to try and kind of uh, uh, reflect uh, on on today's today's society. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry, it took I took a bit too long. I will answer very shortly then, because uh, it's uh, more, more to think about. Um, the first one, the goats in the forest. Um, yeah, maybe that's not sustainable anymore, goats in the forest. Things have changed. You know, I um, forgot to mention, although this is uh, just, um, it's also in the book. You know, the climate changes in the Mediterranean. And the Ottoman Empire was, uh, the Ottoman state was at a time where there were higher precipitations. And, um, more rain, sometimes snow. Um, it's called the Mediterranean autumn, actually. So maybe then it was a sustainable practice. But before also, it, it shapes the landscape. It also means sometimes that the goats eat trees and the forest is not perfect. But maybe the forest is not supposed to be lush in the Mediterranean. Maybe it's something that we envision that it has to be like that. I don't know. This is something to be discussed further uh, with current Mediterranean ecologists and see how they uh, define that. Uh, but there is some um, um, awareness of it. I'm not saying to get uh, every Orthodox on board to believe, because they believe in God, to believe that the role of the human being is that of stewardship. I'm just saying that the Orthodox Church is a separate player of some influence. And if they want to, um, if they jump onto the stewardship, they will do it out of political reasons also. I'm not saying that they, that people in the church don't um, 
wholeheartedly believe that we should in, protect the environment if they're eco theologians, but they might do this because it looks good. <laughs> so I don't know. It's like you know, I would I would say that you know it's also a political move to uh, to act eco theologically today. I don't know. It's it's a um, food for thought. But of course, you know, modern Cyprus is pluralistic, not only not only orthodox. That's right. Um, now the last question, uh, Evan Stel. Thank you both for the interesting discussion. So, Irina, I want to press you a bit on British intentions. So you mentioned a few times that the British had good intentions when they first came to the island, which seemed like an interesting claim to me, given how they're not, they're not an empire known for their altruism and by many people. And I think you base it, you base this claim on some of the good, some of the projects or things that they tried to do when they first came. But it also seems to me that some, um, some things that they did can be seen by others as arrogance or maybe at least like a dismissive attitude towards the local setting. Maybe Nicholas adopts a position like that. I'm not too sure, but it seemed to me like that. But um, anyway, I mean, I don't want to like advocate for a specific position, but I just want to learn more what makes you like think that way. So I'm wondering what could be some like, if that's true, what could be some motivating reasons for um, the British's, uh, the well intentions of the British? Like why would British want to do well in Cyprus? That is, I'm, I know I, I'm, a, I'm convinced that divide and rule was real. You know, that is a strategy. Uh, divide and rule, and you could see it brutally enforced in Cyprus. And there may, um, certainly there were governors. Uh, I mean, I'm not a specialist on British colonial history, but as I know that there were governors who did that very consciously. Uh, you have to divide them, and we know how, and that's how you break them. And um, during Oka, probably they thought that. But um, I always remember vividly what I read in the papers of the Kew Gardens. I was sitting there. No, it was, yeah, it was in Kew Gardens or it was in the papers of the Archbishop when I did some um, research in the, um, in, the, in the archive. And I was reading the archives of the British Council. And the British Council is there to promote a language, culture. You know, they're actually there for um, citizen work. And they were trying to get, in the 50s, they were trying to get all the ethnicity around one table to make them love each other. You know, in the midst of EOKA campaign, you know, they were way too late trying to make, um, they were also envisioning um, some kind of peace between the ethnicities. So all I'm saying is that probably within the body of the British government, colonial government, there were those and those, you know, there were those who, who wanted to just force their economic uh, political interests and others who were very um, enamored with uh, separate culture and wanted uh, peace, love and happiness. And um, so uh, a diversified or uh, like a multivocal perspective also on those who governed um, and who were the colonizers is very important. And uh, because we're now, we're now turning to those who were colonized for good reason, and that's those who have what those have to speak, and they are speaking. And uh, but you know, just that's why that's why I put this um, the fact that they had good intentions, and they had good intentions protecting forests. They wanted to make nice forests and return to some kind of pristine original state, which was wrong because uh, um, yeah, that was a good intention there. I think. Um, All right. Um, by this, we're gonna, we're not ending this, the session because people can stay up and discuss if I, Irene is up for it. Um, mm -hmm. We're gonna end the recording now. So I would like just to thank everyone for coming here and also our speakers. Um, and there's very interesting, and I mean, for me, this is very new. Like I've never really been exposed to like how colonialism has affected the way that we see and we talk environmentally. Um, so yeah, a big thanks. And yeah, we're gonna end the recording now and people can stay to discuss. Um, Nicola, if I may, before you turn off the switch of the recording, um, 
as a Bachchess uh, editor, I would like to say a big thank you, uh, of course, to Irene and uh, Loisos, but also to Avli, who extended this invitation and gave us the opportunity to discuss this issue, uh, which shows how fruitful disciplinary thinking and collaboration can be. So a big thank you to Avli for this uh, uh, for extending this invitation to us. Thank you.